Oh my God. Stop right there. When he's burying him alive and he's shoveling the dirt on his face and, is and Defoe is delivering the monologue, one of many great monologues in this film, and the dirt is going in his mouth and he just presses on. He's like, give the man an, an acting award, please. In that moment, it's, it's so goddamn good. Ready? <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and to Chad and Mel Movie Hour. We are back with um, David Eggers slash Yeagers, uh, however you want to pronounce it, The Lighthouse, his follow-up to 2015's The Witch. And um, I think it's safe to say that Chad and I are both obsessed with this movie. So welcome. We're going to dive in and cheers. Let's do it. Cheers. Hello. All right. So the movie came out last year. Did you, who did you say directed it again? I well, we don't know if it's Eggers or Yeggers, right? The first name. Oh, David. Oh, it's Robert. Robert. <laughs> I was like, I was. I've already had a few drink um, sips, and I was Sorry. like, did she I was, say David or should I say anything? No, it's okay. Let's I'm just hearing, restart. I'm Let's restart. Robert Pattinson's name. Okay, like yes. it's just. A, it's a bunch of notes over here, okay? That's All right. okay. So this is Robert Eggers and or Yeggers, dealer's choice, 2019 follow-up to his 2015 film, The Witch, um, which I think it's safe to say was fairly divisive as well amongst audiences. But right. um, I'm going to toss it over to you for your first impressions, and then we can get into cast, plot, and the rest of it. I loved this film, like, right out of the gate. I loved his choice to do it in the unique, um, more square-shaped format. I loved the black and white. It was gorgeous. I loved how creative it was. I loved how we've talked about this, <clears throat> but um, several films that we've analyzed have been contained, like, in, um, in a specific set or environment, whether it was Alien or Snowpiercer or Mother, mm -hmm. they've been contained in relatively claustrophobic environments, and that lends itself to, like, explosion within that environment, and it's kind of exciting, and um, this does it again with a lighthouse, which they built yeah. for the filming, all the sets and everything, and my favorite part about this film is the writing, that would be number one, um, closely followed by like the acting, closely followed by like the aesthetic of it. So I love all three of those things a lot. And I like this film a lot more than The Witch, um, but I think they're just different films. Not that one is better or not, but The Witch is definitely more, um, I don't know, what, what, what would you say, but The Witch is more, it's definitely more moody and more like atmospheric, but in a way it's kind of more, it's definitely more commercial. So, I mean, cause this is the black and white square format. I mean, yeah. it's asking a little bit more. The writing is more bizarre in this and wonderful and like a novel or something, which is so awesome. You never get to experience dialogue that's that well written that feels natural in the film. And when they're just going back and forth at it in that lighthouse, it's just awesome. I know. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is I didn't until today realize that Robert, I mean, David. <laughs> what? David they're both Edgar. Robert. They're both Robert. They're both Robert? Yes, they're both Robert. So this is just freaking me out because they're both Thomas in the movie, okay? Like this, this is right. Happening. Both of their names are Thomas. Oh man! All right. Anyways, I was today years old when I realized and learned <laughs> Robert Eggers yeah. also wrote The Witch, along uh, in addition to directing it, and he also mm -hmm. wrote The Lighthouse, which is like With his brother to me. And right. he has like. A, a pretty uh, impressive re resume. He's done a lot of short films, but he's also been um, like a like a major player in production design, costume design, and set design and art direction. Not ironically in these two films, but um, I just thought that was an interesting aside. But the witch I got turned on to last year, and I was 
expecting something more traditional horror. And of course you, you don't get that. Um, it, I do think the witch, I will agree with you that the witch is more commercial than the lighthouse, but the witch was still like, not what an, what the audience was expecting, I don't think. So when you when you get into the witch and you realize like, oh, this is just kind of like a really gothic period piece almost. And it's set in like his, the way he uses language of a particular period and tone, like with the lighthouse, it's like, right. you know, sea yarn type of language where the witch is like turn of the century, New England, you know, it's, it's, it's asking a lot of the audience, both films, but the witch I enjoyed, it's not like the greatest movie ever made, but um, it raises really interesting questions about like how long you can hold an audience's attention before you reveal what's going on. And I think he does a lot of that same stuff in this, but I've seen this movie five times now and every time I watch it, it's something new. And I just fucking love it. Yeah, I think you're seeing, I don't know if it's in the wake of The Witch or not, but you're definitely seeing other films like The Witch out there. Like mm -hmm. the new Hansel and Gretel film and some of those films that are our more serious take on horror that is more period. Like yeah. there's, there's definitely a few of those around. There's really nothing like The Lighthouse, I think. Which is cool. Yeah. And if you had told me that the same guy wrote and directed The Lighthouse that did The Witch, I wouldn't have believed you. Like they're so yeah. totally aesthetically, um, obviously right. narratively different. Um, but I think they're both um, much like, you know, um, with Midsummer and Hereditary, you have these directors that are doing these more. I don't know what it's, I mean, I wouldn't call them genre films, but they're like subverting the genre and, and, and in doing so they're like elevating it. I think right. the, uh, Robert Eggers is, ele he elevated horror with The Witch. And I think with The Lighthouse, he just, he set a precedent for like Greek and Roman, well, maybe not Roman, but Greek mythology and like just see mythology. He just set a bar and also said like audiences can handle this and they will love it. And I think that that's the case. Right. It's almost like he he was um, taking steps that direction with which, <clears throat> and then yeah. in the lighthouse felt, according to him, that he was able to truly um, go out on his creative limb and and have full artistic control. And he's like he even made like the format of the film and the way it looks and the fact that it's black and white all part of the package of selling the film as non-negotiable uh he says which is awesome yeah um, and so we, it's definitely like a vision that he had for it yeah and that's come up in pretty much all of our movie hours um at, at least with the directors that are more um our tours if you will that they are um also setting a precedent and demanding that their artistic vision and integrity not be compromised. So anytime that happens, even we're with happy. Madonna. Even with Madonna coming yeah. soon, um, or it already happened, depending upon when you're watching this. But <laughs> um, I wanted to ask your opinion, because we talked a lot about this in Mother and in Snowpiercer, um, is the marketing for the movie and the movie poster and like what your thoughts are on it. Like, did you feel like it represented the vision of the like what you ultimately got like how did you feel about the marketing um well i saw like the blu-ray cover which is basically just their face is really big with pretty black and white with the lighthouse in the background which is just a little bit boring to me um but i think that when one of these um specialty companies like shout factory or arrow films or one of those type of really cool more on the fringes companies puts like a deluxe blu-ray out in five years or something right. it'll have incredible original art that's like mind-blowing that really gets to the core of the film but it's almost like now you just have to have those big heads on the poster to sell the movie and yeah um definitely these actors are the perfect like choices for the film um is there a poster you're thinking of in particular I'm yeah there's, I know the one that you're referring to, but there was right. also, um, there's one of them um, where it's like a wider shot, the camera's farther away oh, from yeah. them, standing in front of the lighthouse, it's it's in black They're and white. They're off to the side. Yeah, it's got like all the That's reviews. That's pretty cool. 
it, it, it's cool, but it's nowhere near as cool as the actual film. And it's oh, nowhere, okay. it's it's like not even a hint of what you're gonna get, really. Um, yes. I mean, that could be like any film, almost. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think But that, I like it. I don't know. I think the trailer did a better job of marketing than the posters did. I think the trailer did a really good job of like setting you up for like, not what to expect in full, but like this isn't gonna be like, you know, a popcorn movie. Like, you know, right. you are getting a very protean, like, you know, a, a CR and like you're getting that. And if you're not into right. that, don't go see this movie. But yeah, to your point, like the casting, I mean, well, Willem Dafoe, when does he fuck up? I don't think ever. Right. And I think Willem Dafoe is sexy in just every sense of that word in terms of his like talent, in terms of the fact that he looks like a skeleton. I just, I love him. And Robert Pattinson, you know, obviously Twilight, whatever. Um, the He's work where he really he, proved himself in this and a few other projects the, recently. The work, yeah, the work that he's done, like uh, <clears throat> Good Time, um, this, I, I'm just, I love him as an actor, Cosmopolis, um, David Cronenberg's Cosmopolis. I think that he is just extraordinary. And in this movie, he is out of this world and much like I was pissed that Jennifer Lawrence didn't get her due with mother I feel the very same way about Robert Pattinson in this like I feel he... even more so about Pat Pattinson, Pat Pattinson in this than I did um J-Law I don't know why um but yeah I mean maybe it's like the dialogue which is really hard in this I think yeah this is and, this and stuff, another... the accent and everything yeah yeah, I wrote down his accent too, and I I had uh, watched an interview like last year when the, when I first saw the movie about how he kind of constructed the accent, and he was speaking to how he just like did an amalgamation of like these different New England accents and then kind of caricaturized it. And yeah. Um, awesome. And to your point about you know this movie having a very specific aspect ratio and it being very boxed in and square and claustrophobic. Um, we've been seeing that come up in a lot of our movie hours, especially like um, Midsummer would shift frame uh, aspect ratios. Obviously, Parasite um, was very deliberate um, in that. And um, I just think that you're on point in that it's 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 a container that's like ready to blow. Like, you know, right. something explosive is coming. The way the way we seem to pick films has a lot to do with who who envisioned them and who directed them, and I think that when you have that type of an auteur behind the camera, they are more deliberate about all those type of aesthetic choices as well. Not just like let's get this thing made, <laughs> let's get right. this filmed and in the can. They're like, oh, I really want it to be more of an experience, and it should extend to you know the framing and everything and. Um, it's a really interesting discussion, the marketing of it, too, because um, a lot of times once the director turns in the edited film, their role is kind of done, right? And they don't yeah. get it pulled in to the marketing of it, which I think is such a shame. Up on the one hand, these companies are marketing based on proven results of what right. they're tracking that sells, that gets people to go to the theater. But unfortunately, it, it's terrible and it's always crap. And it's like it never really gets to the heart of, of the movie the way that everything is, is bled into the actual film itself in a film like this or in a film like Mother. Um, every once in a while, maybe you see it's just interesting because we don't really know how involved the director was able to get in any individual right. takes. You never hear people talking about that in interviews, but I... I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> yes, and um, it's not only does it do a disservice in terms of like not um, giving credit to the, the vision, but it's also it's historically done a disservice when you look at movies like Crimson Peak or um, even I, I would even say like with Hereditary and Midsummer, like there's a lot of marketing that um, is doing exactly what you're saying where like the studios are trying to draw an audience and then they get set up for an experience that they're they don't get and then yeah. 
pointed. And Whether they're... in the trailer or in the trailer too, the way trailers yeah. are done. Yeah. Yeah, but so, especially in movie posters where they all look the same now, like that, that's crazy to me. It's like invasion of the body marketing. <laughs> it's, it's a little, I, I've that, always that noticed fun. it and not liked it. And I've, I've heard some people, you know, talk about it, but not, not often. So yeah. it's, no, it's I, I'm, I'm, interesting. I'm glad that you brought it up. I think the first time you brought it up was um, maybe when we did Snowpierce or where we really started like paying attention to like, the posters and the marketing of things. And I think it's an right. important, it's, it's an important part of the discussion. And I, I think from the moment that, and obviously if you haven't seen this film, you know, well, you're probably not watching this. Um, if you are, you're crazy, but thank you. But like, if you've seen this movie, you know that there's essentially two people in this movie the entire time with the exception of like a mermaid. Um, and to have a, to have two actors carry a film for, an hour and 50 minutes. They They're both so great. Extremely talented and they yeah. deliver 100% of the time. And um, I want to get into the dialogue and the plot and the mythology. Yeah. And the it's, system, but it's mind blowing how good these actors are in this film. Like it, it's mind blowing. It, I think that more so than maybe any film we've almost done. I yeah. mean, I don't want to get crazy, but no, no, the acting is like, in, intensely good right and it's very demanding on these actors they're like in rain this unfortunate scene of one of them uh killing a bird um but that takes like a hundred and a, a million percent dedication in that moment to like pull those kind of things off some of them were it was physically demanding but just like the dialogue and pulling it off and every second you're so riveted and you're like hanging on and it's like all dialogue which yeah. you never get in movies anymore. And we knew that, um, that, um, uh, what's his name? Um, um, or, or Willem Dafoe. Dafoe. We knew Dafoe was a very talented actor from, you know, his past work. But I think that this um, t took it to another level. Like, I've definitely always thought he was like a extremely capable actor. This might be his best work. I, it's extraordinary and it's really I can't hard think to, of something he's done that's better. He's really good in Antichrist, but he's not on screen for very long. I think he's brilliant and born on the 4th of July, but I, I, he's, he's, he's actually better in this though. He's very good in the um, uh, Vincent Van Gogh movie. Um, I yeah, think it's called yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, this is, this is. That's true. Who that's else true, but like. Movie? this role of Defoe. Right, and asking I mean, them to portray so like this type of madness. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just wild. Looks, he looks like a crazed semen lighthouse keeper, like that beard, his, his skeletal structure yeah. was meant for this movie, okay? Like, yeah. stop. Um, so, so are they the same person in this movie? Because that's what I thought uh, after I saw that's, it. Chad, that's and, on three of my <laughs> no that's i don't mean to jump ahead we can get oh, to it later but no that's perfect like let's start with that like are oh, okay. we could ask two big questions and then like kind of circle back to them like are they is it one person mm -hmm. and is it or is it a dream and or is it also just all in his head or a is fever this a dream a fever dream if you will um, or is this actually like playing out like this kind of schizophrenic? Right. Is he talking to himself a la Tyler, Tyler Durden or is this just all in his head? Because he's that shit. So, yeah. I think there's I think definitely some hallucinations, but I don't I think it's really happening. And I do same. I do think they're supposed to be like the same person, but that's definitely not confirmed. But I mean, there's so many similarities that point that way that yeah I, mean, I mean the opening shot they have the, the same name which you don't find out immediately but it gets yeah. revealed yeah 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 there's so much that goes on especially in the last like the last 20 minutes of this film are like built to such an like eruptive like volcanic climax I mean it's just dare I say orgasmic like it's so delicious the last 20 minutes of this movie um yeah. but you know, even from the opening shot, which is just basically like a, a black 
screen and then it kind of fades into a shot of the lighthouse and then quick cuts to the two of them and that iconic just like no, and they look no, a lot alike they have the yeah. same bone structure they do look alike they do very Which much is look weird alike. i would never have thought that but when you see them together in this you think that you know the high cheekbones the strong nose there's a lot of similarities yeah. And even when you read, like when you go down the Reddit rabbit holes or just any of the rabbit holes online, like at pretty much every critic or anyone that's like doing deep dives on this movie are referring to them as young and old Tommy. So I think most people. Yeah. Have, but I hadn't seen those. Ones. I just, you know, thought of it. And then I was like, oh, and then the more you as you watch, it kind of confirms it like over yeah. and over again. But yeah. I mean, those, it's always good to find those afterward because then you can it helps you spot all the places where you can notice it more yeah and it's it's interesting because i i saw the movie when it came out and then i i started a, a program at school and one of the books that we were assigned was moby dick which i had never read um i highly recommend it it's an extremely painful experience um but going back and watching this after having read Moby Dick, it's just another, like, I mean, you can just peel it apart for years. But, you know, from the very beginning of this movie, you have Ephraim's character, who is uh, played by Robert Pattinson, who's this young person, um, a former timber man, a former lumberjack, if you will, who is trying his hand at lighthouse keeping because he thinks he, he might make a little bit more money and, and take to it. And so he's basically the apprentice to Willem Dafoe's lighthouse keeper, who's been there for, we don't know exactly how long, but we know that he was at sea for 13 winters before he even got to the lighthouse. So this man um, has been on the water for quite some time. Um, and the first thing he does, the first thing you see rather when Robert Pattinson's Ephraim moves into the lighthouse is he goes to his bedroom there's a hole in the mattress and he digs out a little statue of a mermaid and off we go, like off to the right. races with the symbols. I mean, like this happens in the first two minutes of the film. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you have, you know, their mm -hmm. first dinner together and, you know, R Willem Dafoe's character who you don't even know, he doesn't reveal his name until three quarters of the way through the movie is, you know, he's drinking, he's trying to get to know um, Ephraim, and Ephraim is not very talkative, and you just have, like, Willem Dafoe's character just picking and egging him on and just aggravating him, and he says, you know, never trust a man who doesn't drink, you know, and he's trying to get him to, like, loosen up, and if you subscribe to the theory that this is one person, and you watch it through that lens, like, what's act, what does that actually mean, you know, like, that he's, he, yeah, that he's working through all of his own self-hatred. Like there's this great scene later on. Um, I love that you're taking us through it. I'll jump around like crazy. Please, please. But there's there's this great scene later on that um, where he's like, you know, I, I hate you. I hate your stinking, like your dirty, nasty. I hate your farts. And it's yeah. just like, it's just like this visceral like hatred that really feels like self-hatred in that moment. The way he's expressing it is, is how we can all relate to those moments we have of maybe self-hatred. And it's just like, uh, he's like dealing with all that in a way. Um, so there's a lot of times when they interact where it's like, okay, he's dealing with something within himself. It just applies to it so well. Yeah. and. I I, I just wanted to, this is a little bit of an aside, but I forgot to mention it because you brought it up and it's, it's an important point. The dialogue in this movie, just before we go any further, is, again, I think it asks a lot of the audience, but like once you get into it, you just immediately like fall in love with it and you're like there for it. And it's, it's I think it's important if you have the opportunity to watch it with subtitles, which I never like to do with a movie. I, it's not my thing. But watching this movie with subtitles, I think, is really, yes. really important. So much more comes up. But, yes. you know, for the actors, I mean, this is like sh doing Shakespeare. This language right. and this dialogue, the cadence, the accent. I mean, it's extraordinary. Oh, and again, it's very so close that they did not get nominated or win any awards for this. No, I know. You know? But That's yes. wild. As a screenplay, at least. I mean, in the acting, I mean, how... Ugh. I don't get it, but yeah, it's very upsetting. It's deeply upsetting, but but um, um, 
yeah. that's so that's it's so amazing the dialogue and uh, it reminds me of clockwork orange <laughs> <laughs> which I'm now mentioning for the third movie hour in a row. I promise it's not really even in my, probably not in my top 10 films, actually. I feel like we need to do a movie hour. On <laughs> I guess so. I, it's not, I'm not that, that I'm not, I don't live my life by clockwork as much as I love it, but I can't help it because I'm noticing these things in these specific movies. Um, but like how they developed, actually it's the, the novel of clockwork that developed that language that they speak, which is a mix of, um, I think like Cockney and like some Russian and like a few different things, like all mixed together. And he made his own language for like this, the street kids, the younger right. um, people in that story to speak, which is so awesome. And I love it so much. Um, it's kind of like you, such a talent to be able to write in a language like you invent. They, they're kind of doing that in this film. Um, but it's also like a film for people that love to read, I think, because of the dialogue. Like yeah. the dialogue affects you like when you're reading, which yeah. is so unusual of a film. Um, like it's very visual dialogue. It like you like how, you know, a lot of novels are. Um, so as they're saying it, you're not just getting the visuals from the screen. You're getting a lot, you know, upstairs, too. So, which is so awesome. And I could not rate the dialogue any higher in this film. Right. Um, it, to your point, not for everybody, but like, I feel like for someone like you or I, this is like what we want to sign up for. This is, we are here for it 110% and we're just like eating it up. Yes, 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 yes. Cheers to all of that. And you just actually named and articulated something that, I had a felt sense of, but hadn't quite like named and you just fucking did it. And I'm so grateful, which is that this is very much a, a great film for people that are readers. And you, I mean, you're, you just said quote unquote visual dialogue. And I, you just like named it, like without having the subtitles on the dialogue of, of this film is it's, it's, it's like mother in Alien. It's its own character. Like, it, it's right. a life of its own, and it's so um, delicious and vibrant and, and, and musical that it is very much visual. Like, when you're hearing them speak, it's almost like reading words off of a page. Like, you're getting such a rich yep. experience. So, yeah, thank you for naming that. It's spot and on. Be, and because of that and everything else, this director is so exciting. I cannot wait to see what else he does. Um, yeah, he's, he's, and, he's in production yeah. for this movie called The Northmen, um, which is going to be a Viking tale. So I'm super here for this. Yeah. Cool. It's, yeah. yeah. I can't wait to see the whole future for this, this guy, because he is yeah. so talented. I, yeah, I just, I, I immediately want to rewatch the movie already. Um, yeah, and, and there was, there, you know, you get such, it's so visually arresting. Um, Did you find any parts of it hard to watch? You know, him bashing the seagull obviously is going to affect Mel because I love my animals and it's just such a visceral thing. Um, I, I, but that didn't like, you know, I wasn't like freaked out by it. Um, right. No, I was a real bird. I was in, more right in the story. The bird has an evil eye that really the only way to stop. Or, or, well, there's different takes on it, right? Because um, Defoe's character says, now that you killed it, that's extremely bad luck. Like, right. that's... You can't, damn it's bad luck to kill a super, yeah. But, but he had this, like, it was like the telltale heart, the Edgar Allan Poe story where he knew the body was under the floorboard, so he heard the heart, and he heard it louder and louder. It was like that, but with the seagull's eye. Like, it was like an itch that he had to scratch because he just, like, had to get it. There was something evil about it, and he just had to, like, kill it. That's kind of how... Do think, why do you think, though, the seagull is taunting him? I mean, I think it's symbolic, like so many things in this film, but I am not sure exactly why. It's, there, were, it's there, was, there was a lot of disturbing imagery, though, besides just that. I mean, there yeah. was the whole uh, mermaid vagina moment. There was, like, a lot of tentacle action. None of it was disturbing necessarily in a bad way, but it's very arresting. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's not a passive film. No. It assaults and yeah, you I, at, from time to time. 
It does assault you, but I, I would say it's not the, even the, I think arresting is a better word because like, to me, disturbing, like I, I was more like disturbing. I think, I, I think of images like in midsummer when like the two people jump off the cliff, right? Like, right. and you see like skulls uh, bashed open. This to me was more like an assault on the eyes, but like in the best way possible. And yeah. like, it right. wasn't nothing I saw set me per se but I was just like right. oh shit that was like my my looking balls were not ready for that you know this is gonna sound gross but like the way that Defoe is like constantly farting and he has like really dirty trousers and you just know that he's like has shit like that there's yeah. just like excrement on this like filthy animal person yeah. and when um Pat Patterson looks at him I wonder, I, I, I can't say Thomas and Thomas. I forget his other name in the film. It's it's Ephraim, but yeah, Ephraim. Thomas and Tommy. Yeah. When he looks at him, he looks at him with such disgust, but it's like what he's become. Do you right. know what I mean? Which, oh, yeah. in a way, as how I saw it. This is open to interpretation, but yeah. um, that made such sense to me. Like, oh, how, how you can see yourself as we all age or as we all... Uh, succumb to the failed expectations of life, uh, yada, yada, yeah. you get to a place where you're just like disgusted either with life or what you've become or in any one moment. I mean, right. Oh, we've all kind of been there. So, so yeah. it's just like, it's so interesting because it just reads to me so much that like, he's just seeing himself. Yeah. It, he's yeah. seeing himself. He's seeing his, what he's become, he's seeing his shadow. Um, and and we've talked about this in, in multiple movie hours about movies that don't try to be funny, but are funny. And this movie's fucking funny. Like, yeah. you know, the whole thing where like Robert Pattinson's Ephraim slash Thomas calls Willem Dafoe's Tommy out constantly for like farting and like just, it, it's funny. And then like, like Willem Dafoe will yeah, just like sometimes. It's just funny. But yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, I want to get more into like the symbolism of like them being the same person. But as an audience member, you know, you have these moments that are some of the most important and my favorite in the movie, which are like their dinners together because they ultimately, right. what do they have to eat together. And right. Willem Dafoe's cook is the, is the one that cooks the food. And that becomes a very important point later on in the movie and also um, a very funny moment. But you have these, these dinners that devolve into fucking madness. Um, yeah. As the yeah. progresses, they're originally only supposed to be there together for a four week round. And then what you've come to find out, and, and this is something I wanted to ask your thoughts on because there's not a lot, even when you go down like subreddit rabbit holes, there's not a lot of like information and theory on this, but midway through the movie when, um, you know, they, they come off of one of their um, drinking vendors and the their relief was supposed to come. And Robert Pattinson's Ephraim wakes up and he thinks he's just like, he missed the boat or whatever because he was passed out for one night. And then Willem Dafoe comes in and says, no, bro, like you've been passed out for weeks. So you have this like loss of time. Yeah, and that, that Willem Dafoe fucking with him. And if they're the same person, what does that mean? Right. And did he fuck with him or did he really like, because at this point they're drinking gaslight, right? Like they're really yeah. drinking the lantern oil oh from God. the light because they ran out of booze. What, what do you think about <laughs> how when um, younger Thomas, I'll say younger Thomas and older Thomas, younger Thomas finds the vlog book finally which has been under lock and key mm -hmm. from older Thomas where he's put down all of his condescending notes about um and maybe accurate notes about how he has been um all the things he's been doing one of them I guess addresses his masturbation because he's off uh, assaulting himself he calls it in the outhouse or whatever I forget yeah. what the burning was but that was really good but then he he talks about um, you know insubordination um, this and that uh, recommend you know le uh, recommend uh, docking his wages right the exact wording is but um, 
that when you when you see that it's almost like somebody taking account and waking up to the realization of how they've sab- self sabotaged. Yes. Whenever you're you're dealing with your own self sabotage of like God, I'm so stupid. Why didn't I do this? Why why did I do that? Why why was I so lazy? Why didn't I accomplish anything? Um, that's kind of how I read that. But I, yeah. To, to chalk another one up to maybe they're the same person, but. Right, yeah, I think that's a really good reason. I hadn't thought about like the self-sabotage aspect of it, but now that you say that, what's coming up for me is like, and I have in my notes that there was a little bit of an, annihil- an annihilation similarity uh, to the oh, film yeah. and I, and which I wanna get to, but what's coming up for me now that you say that is, that's a big theme of the movie Annihilation is self-sabotage and if they are in fact the same person then yeah him reading the logbook of like what he did and reading in black and white like how he's devolved over time like is pretty a self-reckoning a re- right. take us to church, take us to church <laughs> so let's talk about the masturbation there's a lot of masturbation in this movie a lot of um, masturbation at least we love three it. there's like three or four scenes I, I think if we're lucky, Which I think makes, might make it hard for some of the bros to watch. <laughs> yeah. Because I've heard, I heard from one of my bros, they were like, it was a lot of masturbation. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It wasn't All too much for me. <laughs> they secretly enjoy it and just don't know how to let themselves. But like, you well, have I think two- that speaks to, I mean, I think it's warranted. I don't think it's flippant. I think it it's speaks not. to like the frustration alone on a lighthouse. Right. What else would you do? Definitely. And it also um well, one man to, to masturbate can be to be sexually frustrated, which can be to be frustrated. And mm-hmm. they're both very frustrated. Um, um the younger Thomas is extremely frustrated because he's there with um uh sometimes no end in sight when he thought there was one. And he's also um, he's also he's, there with somebody he hates. I mean, at, there was someone he hates who he thinks is kind of sabotaging him, and he thinks that, especially when he finds that log book, like, what have I been doing, wasting all my time here? He gets right. extremely upset. But so that's like a form of release that almost becomes like mandatory, like right. You know, yeah, yeah, and. But, there's, there's, I mean, even in like the first five minutes, well, maybe not first five minutes, but like maybe in the first 15 minutes of the movie, when Robert Pattinson first sees how creepy his man, his, his boss, his partner, his light fellow lighthouse keeper is, is when he um, looks, I can't remember if he's looking down through the floorboard or up through the ceiling, but he, he catches Willem Dafoe fucking the mattress where the mermaid yes. is for. And then oh, yeah. the editing in this movie is so good because you have so many quick cuts. There's some shots I don't understand too. And that's one of them because his eyes get wide, but the way he, the, I think there's more to it than just like, I'm shocked that he's masturbating. Right. There's something right. else to it, but yeah. I want, yeah, that's a good, yeah. I wonder and I find it. some of the, the um, older Thomas morphing into the octopus a la Lovecraft, who we've spoken a lot about. Um, so, yeah, I, I find get that a little confusing and disturbing, but in a good way. But a little bit like, um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of like artistic imagery like this. We have to talk about that main setup that the director did where the light is coming out of Defoe's eyes onto the younger Thomas, and it's like a painting, and it's the ultimate Prometheus like mythology awesome moment. That was so incredible. And at the end, there's also another painting, a moving painting, uh, that's the very last shot of the film where he's yeah. getting pecked by the the seagulls and he's dying on the rocks. And they're yes. both set up and filmed and lit like a painting. And it's yes. gorgeous. It's literally art. And it's, it's beautiful. And you never see that. For that alone, this movie gets an A+. <laughs> No, for that alone, though, like that, just the the shot of Willem, naked Willem Dafoe, light coming out of his eyes onto Robert Pattinson is like, like Michelangelo level. Like, how did this movie not yes. get an Oscar? And the last shot of the movie um, is is um, date Ro- Robert Eggers um, took that um, imagery of 
Tommy, young Tommy, um, slash Ephraim, slash Robert Pattinson, from a Dutch painting, um, and I have it here in my notes, but um, my eyes not finding it, so I'll come back to it. But you know, I want to I, I want to talk about that, but I I want to bef before any of that happens, we have um, Robert Pat the masturbation escalates, if you will. So like <laughs> first he just yeah. spot Willem Dafoe fucking a mattress. Okay, whatever we get it, and then we spot. Robert Pattinson, got, you know, sneaking into the lighthouse, which he's not allowed to go up to the top because no one's allowed to handle the lighthouse glass except for Willem Dafoe. He's made that very clear. It's forbidden. Right. And Willem Dafoe has used language like, quote unquote, I'm wedded to this light. So right. Willem Dafoe and is like in, in very early on in the movie, he makes it clear that like he it's it's his show. He's running it. You're not touching my lighthouse. But also that, like, he's he's telling Robert Pattinson's character about his former number two um, and how he went mad looking at the light and was, quote unquote, enchanted by the light and thought it was his salvation when the same thing has happened to Willem Dafoe and will happen to mm. Robert Pattinson. So there's this forbidden fruit. Here comes mother again. There's this forbidden fruit aspect to the light. But you see the shot where Robert Pattinson is in the lighthouse and he's looking up the spiral staircase and the spiral is a whole other metaphor. But like he's hearing Willem Dafoe ma masturbating and then you see what looks to be semen drip down and then he looks back up and there's just like this huge tentacle and like this right. monster. Like, and he, just he leans into the semen, which was confusing to me too. I think <laughs> there's some confusing well, things for me in this film. I don't Not know what many, that means but... either, but it, it harkens back to what you said earlier about when he first sees him masturbating, how his eyes dilate. That's got to mean more than just like, oh, this is shocking and taboo. I, yeah, and I don't believe that he's attracted to him because he's clearly repulsed by him, if anything. So mm -hmm. then what does it mean? Yeah. I don't know. It's it's, well, it's interesting because when the semen comes down, it turns into what like almost looks like slime. Right. Like it becomes thicker and more like um, viscous. Yeah, more like what you would think of as like sea creature slime in a way. Right. And then of course you said, as you said, you see the tentacle, and which is an amazing so, shot. And it's so to your point, it's so Lovecraftian, right? Like and yes. and. It's also very 20,000 leagues under the sea. So you have like Jules Verne there too. It's okay, like, then, yeah. it's like, I mean, and it's also Moby Dick. It's like the, you know, the, yep, it the, is. the Leviathan. It's, it's like all of these yeah. mythologies just like in one shot and how a filmmaker can- I'm in love with this director. With I know, but like to elicit all of that sim symbology in like one shot, it's just right. like masterful. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I want to get back to the, um, tentacles and all of that, but I wanted to ask what you think, like, the light represents, because very early oh, on, right. you do see Willem Dafoe, like, um, and Robert Pattinson's not seeing this, just the audience is seeing this, I, if I'm remembering correctly, but you see naked Willem Dafoe at the top of the lighthouse staring into the lighthouse glass, just like hypnotized yeah. high on it. He's high and, on it, right. And that's and why I, he doesn't want to share it. He's like, right. he's, he's, holding, just, he's withholding a good thing. And if you think of them as the same person, I mean, it could be like a, either really good thing or a really bad thing, like meth or something. You think of like drug addiction, but right. um, if they're the same person, it's like one person, it's like you abstaining and then presenting yourself for abstaining in any particular thing. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I had but um, yeah, it is interesting. I have no clue. I think we're not supposed to know. I don't think there is a specific answer to what is in the light. There, there's in this incredible shot when um, young Thomas finally peers into the light and just goes mad. And like right. you see his face illuminate to the point where like it looks like he doesn't even have teeth and you just see like the inside the roof of his mouth and his uh, tonsils. And it's just like, it's so incredible. It's like a perfect shot. And then of course he falls back down the stairs and everything. And 
basically he kind of like goes mad for a minute. Very also very Lovecraftian. Um, yeah, but I think it's obviously it's symbolic. I don't think we're supposed to be like, oh, it's this. But um, right. you kind of read into it whatever you want, whether it's like the meaning of life or just I don't know. It's like the the holy grail, if you will. Like it's whatever you need it to be. Right. Like, that scene that you just referenced at the end of the movie, which is like one of the second to the last shots, which is Robert Pattinson finally staring into the lighthouse glass and, and, and the light coming out of it. And he's doing this beautiful primal scream. He, he's literally just drank more of the lighthouse oil. He's high, he's drunk, he's just killed yeah. Willem Dafoe or himself, we'll get into it. But like, there's just this primal scream that you can hear, but it's muted. So you just see his like yeah. mouth again, and you know he, it, the light envelops him. And what I was reminded of in that was um, what I mentioned or um, uh, mentioned earlier, which is um, in one of the final scenes of Annihilation, where you see Jennifer Jason Lee's character um, succumb to this alien entity, and she stares into it, and as such, she like gets enveloped and becomes the light herself. Yeah. Um, but it annihilates her, it destroys her, which is very much what happens to Robert Pattinson. But also circling back to where we first see Willem Dafoe do this early on in the movie where he's staring into the light and we realize, okay, this guy's more than just a, you know into his lighthouse, right? Um, right? What came up for me in that scene was the scene in Danny Boyle's Sunshine, which is one of my favorite sci-fi movies, sci-fi space movies, if you will, where um, one of the um, members of the crew on the ship is staring out of an observation deck at the sun, and it has like filters on it, obviously, so you don't immediately burn up and die. But <laughs> he, he's obsessed with looking at the sun, and he continues to increase or decrease the filters to make it brighter and brighter. And when he's describing the sensation that he gets from from looking at the sun to the rest of the crew he says you know it's it's not like being in a um a deprivation tank or an isolation tank where everything's black and womb like when you stare into pure light it envelops you and i was getting a lot of that with this like the light That's interesting. Is, is enveloping them it's feeding them but it's ultimately going to destroy them too and i think um the great philosophers and artists of our time and of all time have constantly searched for meaning and what and what is the meaning of life what is the meaning of anything and so i think that is expressing that like the need to know to, the need to know more meaning behind the unknowable whether it's the way the universe works god purpose all those like bigger questions that we've always wrestled with and you see that at the end of 2001 a space odyssey when they're flying through and all the colors are coming and um it ends with the star child and it's like well what does that mean well it's it's what you read into it but it also helps you to think about it more mm -hmm. and anything that helps us think in that way is more important than just getting the answer because okay. no one really has those answers anyway Right. But, yeah. The questioning is is what keeps us from going crazy because we'll never get the answers. It's likely that we won't, at least right. until we pass to whatever's next. But the questioning is very much human nature. And without the search for meaning, like, why are we here? Like, what's the point of it all? It's right. like it's it's the human race's M.O. Um, and yeah, this movie does a great job of it um, without like shoving it down your throat. I wanted to ask you what you thought of the siren slash mermaid. Um, oh, situation. that was one of my favorite elements. Um, she's so beautiful, first of all. And he's so starved for like genuine affection, which he gets really hardly none of from the light housekeeper. Human see, contact in general, yeah. Yeah, human contact from someone other than this farting, disgusting person, which I suspect is himself anyway. So. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but from a beautiful woman, which is what he is, is um, you know, longing for and stuff. And even in a different scene of him masturbating, which we did not reference yet, he 
he's holding <laughs> on to the small mermaid and rubbing it, you know, and um, so he's clearly fantasizing about that mermaid, but it gets into all kinds of, like, bestiality and, and just areas that are, like, questionable. Is it bestiality or is it not because it's, like, a fantasy creature? It's not a real creature anyway, and the whole thing is a fantasy um, for him in that moment yeah. when he's uh, pleasuring himself, so there's just so many different, like, things, ways to think about it. Um like, is she all just a fantasy? I don't think she's real in the film, maybe, but it's um. But when you first meet her and he sees her, you ask. get a, you get a sense she's really there. But then he never really sees her again. But then and later she comes her, back. And when he finds her, she's, for all intents and purposes, dead. And then all of a sudden she like right. wakes up. But he's he's like molesting her and feeling her up. Um, she's and then into she's, it. They're having sex, and then. He realizes that, you know, as the camera's scanning down her body, because we start off with her head, it's just a close up, and it's a human female Minimal. head, yeah. right? That's very important. And then as the camera goes down, you get like the hint of gills. So then it's starting to turn, and then and you see, out. then it turns to he full scale. She's a mermaid, and he's like, he, he freaks out. And he's freaking out, but he already knew that. That confuses me too, because he already knew that. He but was in. But there's, there, we're talking about, I think, two different scenes at once, because when he first yeah. discovers her, the audience thinks that this is real. Like, he, he finds this body, and she's covered in seaweed. No, no, no. He first sees her under the water in the ocean, like, oh, earlier right. in the film. And he sees yeah. that she's a full mermaid. The tail is, like, beautiful in the shot and everything. Yeah, I forgot and about then, that. And then Annie has that little mermaid. I'm not sure when the scene of him masturbating right. with a small mermaid it's, That's if towards it's the end when he's kind of end, right okay so it's like he should know that that's the mermaid unless like he just only sees the face at first and doesn't make the connection but then he gets freaked out and then we have the close-up of the fish genitalia which yeah. is is very similar to the human genitalia but just i think bigger and more I guess more yeah. intense. It's supposed to be more intense and graphic. Yeah. It's supposed to really hit you in that moment. And um, it does. I think it's beautiful, like that she just has like, you know, this large vagina, like right on where like our belly button kind of would be, like right at our navel. Right. And and it forces you, know, you to question if if it's okay, because the scene is sexy in some ways. And she's incredibly sexy, the actress. So, and, you know, it forces you, it confronts you, and it forces you to, to um, think about where you stand with some of these lines. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's bestiality if it's a mythical creature, but I... I <laughs> That's what I was I, wondering. There's actually a term for sex with mythical or fantastical creatures. If you know what it is, comment. But, um, then, but then if we find this creature to be a real creature in real life, would this particular creature, would sex with this particular type of a creature, if it was a real creature, not a, mythological, a, a mythological creature, right? would it be con considered bestiality? But if they're like half human and they're intelligent and sentient? No. No? I don't think so. I think it would be... It'd be like interspecies sex, own, but not... Yeah, it have its own term. I think it would just be like interspecies. It'd be like if, if we discovered a, a race of, like, like the um, avatar creatures, like if we had sex with one of them, it'd be like an interspecies... Yeah, but that's... It's not bestiality because they're not... But it not wouldn't be bestiality, bestiality. right? Because they they're they're sent as sentient as we are, like I was rewatching District Nine last night and they you know there's they don't show it but they allude to the fact that humans are having sex with the prawns which are the name of the aliens in the movie, mm -hmm. and that's just interspecies right. sex. It's not bestiality because bestiality implies that you're having sex with like a lower form creature. Right, which they that, shouldn't be considered <laughs> lower lower form creatures anyway, technically. Right, but, but I mean, a creature that doesn't have cons the verbal consent, I guess. Right. right? Yeah. It's 2020. Yes. Even for animals, 
Get consent from your animals, people. Put on um, your 2020 lenses. No, please. For this one for and then long. take them off. <laughs> it's a really good question, but like, you it's know. It's an interesting you area to explore. He, he sees if you're her brave. At the end of well, you know, it also harkens back to like the fetishization of mermaids, which is time immemorial, right? And sure. you, you, it goes back to Greek mythology and, you know, sirens and have ultimately represented like yeah, both the ultimate, like high like the highest form of femininity and and female and goddess but also mm -hmm. the shadow of that which is like the the demon woman and the sirens of greek mythology would lure men in with their songs um, mm -hmm. and you do get the the sirens scream in this which is awesome yes. and then ultimately devour them or enslave them um so because women are evil yeah but especially I especially mean, hoary ones right and i it reminds me also the movie doesn't remind me of splash but like this fetishization of mermaids reminds me of splash which is one of my favorite movies where you have tom hanks falling in, in love with mermaid daryl hannah oh, splash yes and you have you know the little mermaid which you know there's just an obsession even amongst women with mermaids yeah. like there's just they're they're, yeah. they're amazing and they embody so much uh, think, mythology and power. I think when he's confronted with the graphic realization that she's half fish, it's like it's like confronting your fears or things that it's like in dreams. Like you know how when you dream, you're often things pop up that are insecurities that you haven't dealt with or fears that you might have. Um, so it's almost like a dream in that sense. The whole the whole film because he does seem to be confronted a lot with like his past, um, maybe fears, insecurities, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, he's, yeah. and, and a lot of people will liken mermaids and sirens to the embodiment of fear and like confronting fear. So you're like spot on like that. And it's, they're definitely the embodiment of like come hither, like the female, the female um, attraction and the call, the siren call. Yeah. It's so the ultimate seductress. Yeah. Yes. Like can't you quite literally can't resist. And yeah. um, and I love it. it's interesting to me because the actress even has like um, like a mermaid quality up to her face, even like her <laughs> lips and the way just her face kind of looks. It has this beautiful like mermaid quality. I don't know how to describe that's, it, but that's racist. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Speciesist. No, yeah, she is really beautiful. Um, for somebody her, that has her to top lip, the way her lips are shaped, it does recall like um, like sea life. I don't want to say in a bad way. I don't mean it in as an well, insult. I'm with you. I was like, no. It's, this this went she, down a dark alley just now. <laughs> um, no, but it's very much true though. Like she does yeah. have very um, uh, uh, sharp and aggressive. Right. Like if you, if you said a, if you said a beautiful woman had like feline features, it wouldn't be an insult. So I right. mean this the same way, but they're like more um, amphibious like features. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, and she's and, gorgeous, and, but um, and she's definitely his type in the film until, I guess he gets down. But well, I mean, you know, the, the first time we see her is that shot in the beginning of the movie where we just kind of see her in floating in the water. Then he finds her dead-ish on the shore, and then when we really see her in the vagina and, and all of it is when he's gone mad already in the third act, and he's masturbating aggressively to the mermaid statue and you're seeing all these flashes of her um right. and you get the vagina and it quit it as he's masturbating like it's cutting between her, shots of her shots of him making love to her to shots of willem defoe to shots of the guy that so, murdered. so is that real then or is that his fantasy turning on him i think it's his fantasy turning on him because that all would make of sense yeah because they purposefully interject the blonde haired guy in the that um who is that guy so i had the same question i, I think it's a stand the in guy that he for killed? the guy that he let die as a oh, lumberjack okay. and or it's yes the, the guy that younger thomas let die 
Right, younger Thomas let because die. we without... find the guy that older Thomas killed, and he doesn't look like that blonde guy. Right, so, okay. That was a little... Right, so I, th and even in the third act, I think Robert Pattinson's um, Ephraim slash Thomas calls out Willem Dafoe's Tommy and says, I found your number two in the lobster trap. Right. So I confirmed that Willem Dafoe killed his partner, his former partner, and I right. think... The, the guy that we see in flashes when Robert Pattinson is masturbating, the blonde hair guy, is the guy he let die when he was a lumberjack. So why does that yeah, guy yeah, pop I up? Think, while he's... I think past coming to haunt him. His right. fantasy. While well, he's just saying. <laughs> yeah, but you know what also, what that scene reminded, have you seen Mulholland Drive? Yeah, of, of course. That's one of my favorite movies. Yeah. So, Mulholland Drive, amongst its many uh, masterful, epic moments, um, is Naomi Watts' masturbation scene, where right. she aggressively- angry masturbation scene. And I was thinking of, that came up for me when we see that masturbation scene that we're discussing with Robert Pattinson, is he's right. mad, he's gone mad, and all of this shit, and, and like what, um, like how masturbation and just like sexual arousal can release certain things, um, good things and bad things. So like all of right. this shit, as you say, like his yeah. fantasy is turning on him. Or how, his how process. you can use it. Um, and when I say use it, it yeah. you're taking advantage of it to, right. to, to a degree where it's not even fun anymore, but it's like, you're just you have to angry it. almost. Yeah. yeah, it's like an exorcism. Like you're yeah. getting something out of your system. Literally and metaphorically. Anyways. Yeah, so, wow. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, the scene? Because speaking of dialogue, this is where it comes to, like, its, its head is where um, they have run out of booze. They have gone past their four weeks. We don't know by how long because we don't know if Robert Pattinson passed out for one night or as... Willem Dafoe has convinced him it's been weeks, but basically they're on their own. I mean, no one's, they're out of How do you pass system. out for weeks? I find that confusing too. See, there are some things that confuse me in this movie. Yeah. I don't have an answer to that either. That's like one of the big questions of the movie. And yeah. I think it would be unanswered, like this gap in time. Right. But long it's story, okay. It's making us question. Yeah. They, yeah. they start having to drink the, the gaslight essentially. Um, and I'm using wow. the term gaslight instead of lantern oil in this moment on purpose because gaslighting actually does take place <laughs> later on in the movie. But those scenes are so great. Like the scene where poison to get yeah. drunk and high, and they're right. And and, and at then the he first, he's like, "You're not going to drink on my watch." In the in the beginning, the older one to the younger one, like right. And then he's like, "Cut well, well, to yeah. they're dancing around the table together." Like totally drunk out of their minds. Yeah. And the scene with where it's the the aerial shot down the stairwell where they're drinking at the bottom of the stairwell together. That's such a great scene. And at the very end, um, Defoe like leans into Patterson's character. Oh, it's it's so great. It's just like. Yes. The the, the cinematography of this movie is <clears throat> second to none. And yeah. you know have this. Again, we're getting to like the last 20 minutes of the movie. We're in the third act. They're they're both fucking batshit crazy. They're hallucinating. They're high. They're tired. They're exhausted. They're sexually frustrated. They hate each other, but they love each other. And then you right. have like this argument, this epic argument, which results in like this beautiful monologue by Willem Dafoe, where they <laughs> can't remember. They keep confusing each other. Because basically Robert Pattinson at this juncture knows that Willem Dafoe is not who he claims to be. And he's fucking pissed. And they they get drunk and they, they're dancing. They're slow dancing together. And then Willem Dafoe leans in for a kiss. And Robert Pattinson is like, not today, Satan. But then they end up like embracing each other and just kind of like oh, yeah. and rocking each other. But at that point, they they... They, they don't know themselves apart from one another, which is, right. again, leads into the, and, are they the same person? Because they're like, yeah. I'm Thomas. Well, you're Thomas. No, I'm well, Thomas. and they both call each other out in, in a way that one would call themselves out, I think, internally. 
and then, and all this is leading to that scene where um you know he eventually attacks him and chokes him and there's a fight and um he turns into the full on octopus octo octopus <coughs> man yeah. um sea creature very lovecraftian with the tentacles and everything um yeah it's like I, it's a I wild think, ride i think the kit like the fact that willem dafoe leans in for a kiss is just like what does that mean is that like him trying to learn how to love himself again or forgive himself for like the just... ultimate loneliness and desperation like yeah i'll lean into for a same-sex kiss when i'm not even same-sex attracted probably Do but you know that's what I mean? could be right if but that's if we're reading it as two separate people but if we're reading right. it as the same person like what right. could that possibly mean and so the then fact if, that if they're the same person when he first young thomas first sees old thomas uh, masturbate and he's intrigued maybe it's like sparking like maybe it's just the thought maybe i should do this do you know what i mean i don't know okay. yeah uh, i'm getting yeah. really into the weeds with it now well there you, you know, know what i mean it's almost like the spark of the imagination of like i'm gonna go masturbate that right first thought you have <laughs> <laughs> that first thought you have when you wake up in the morning, I'm gonna go masturbate. <laughs> but they're, you know, when when the, you're seeing them like embrace and like they've just kind of like they they've given themselves both given themselves over both to madness. But they're yeah. they, Robert Pattinson, Pattinson is just like he's had a fucking enough, and they get into this argument, and then you know Robert Pattinson delivers this amazing line of dialogue where he's just like I just want to stay and it's funny it's sad and it's brutal but it's funny he's like, I just want a fucking steak and he's just he says oh yeah. boy I just really want a steak and if I have he's a like, steak you don't I'm like my cooking steak. yeah well I'm defense, like well, you don't like my cooking and he's like the no, dialogue it's not that. is so great and it's like, delivered so a, great if I had a steak I would fuck it like it's just so good and then um, yeah. yeah, Willem Dafoe's like, you're you're not fond of me lobster? I mean, it's just <laughs> so well written. And so then eventually good. Willem Dafoe, like, starts to um, pray to or summon Triton, you know, king of the sea, basically right. Zeus, or Poseidon, rather, and he's he's cursing Robert Pattinson, and he's smiting him, and he delivers yeah. one of the most beautiful monologues ever. And then it just... <laughs> And he says, I want you to be devoured until you are no more, till your soul is no more, um, but is now itself the sea. And then after that amazing epic di monologue, Robert Pattinson just like looks up at him and is like, I do like your cooking. Like, it's just it's so great. Brilliant. It's Can fucking it be great brilliant. If, what, um, what if the light from the lighthouse is something that he already knows because the older one has already seen it? But mm. he doesn't want to admit yet about himself. Okay. And then, you, yeah. then he has to come to a reckoning and admit to himself that he's fucked up or that he fucked his life up or that he's a piece of shit or whatever it is that you have to, in life, ultimately come to terms with. Yes. Yes. This? Yes. 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 And so, like, yeah. this is. This is, yeah, 100%, I think that's spot on. And, like, the perfect metaphor for what the light means in the context of this movie. And, and like, the last couple of shots of this movie, which, you know, let's get into it, like, the Lovecraftian moments. Like, after this big blowout, basically, Robert Pattinson, he, he had enough. And he goes out and basically begins to bury Willem Dafoe alive. But but just gives up at a certain point and takes his lighthouse key off. Oh my God, stop right there. When he's burying him alive and he's shoveling the dirt on his face and, is and Defoe is delivering the monologue, one of many great monologues in this film and the dirt is going in his mouth and he just presses on. He's like, give the man an, an acting award, please. In that moment, it's, it's so awesome. goddamn good. I'm very upset right now, and I gotta get another bottle of Sutter Home. I'm very upset right now. Yeah. <laughs> Will is so being buried alive with the dirt in his mouth, like you said. He just, he's still fucking 
spinning this be- these beautiful yarns of oh he's just and he doesn't uh, stop he he doesn't stop he's such a consummate performer in that moment he's oh so committed God. to the material which is the ultimate like perfect acting i mean yeah where are the awards yeah we have we have to start a, a, a petition. So and it never becomes silly in that moment that all of a sudden he's got dirt, that he's spinning dirt. It never becomes unintentionally comedic because it's so well done. I mean, that could become silly. Yeah, but it, you have... It's silly in parts where it intends to be, but it doesn't cross the line where it, it should be serious, where all of a sudden it doesn't work. And that's a testament to the actors. For sure. And- Enter the writing, of course, but I mean, you know, Robert Pattinson stops the process and it's just like takes the key to the lighthouse, pieces out, goes back into the house, and then Willem Dafoe comes back with an axe trying to kill. <laughs> oh, no, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, a little bit of a scuffle, and then ultimately Pattinson slash Ephraim slash young Tommy kills older Tommy slash Willem Dafoe brutally with an axe. And then um, goes into the lighthouse and you have this shot where he gets to the top of the lighthouse or maybe this is before. Well, yeah, because it's daytime when he's burying him, but it's definitely nighttime when he sees the light, right? Right. Because it's black behind him. When he goes up to the lighthouse, I forget when exactly this takes place, this iconic moment where he goes up to the lighthouse and he sees what he believes to be Willem Dafoe and he pulls the person up and it's him. It's another Robert right. Pattinson. So that like, what weird. the fuck is there? Uh, what is that? Because that's when he, telling you right there that they're the same person. I know, but when he does that, those look up and the naked Willem Dafoe is there. Yeah. So what the fuck is that? I don't know. I don't understand. I don't know, but here's something else that I don't understand is why he doesn't fall out it would have been so dramatic and maybe a lost um a missed opportunity for him to fall back from the lighthouse and fall from the top of the lighthouse after after seeing the light for the light not to like force him through the glass and out the top and all the way down to the ground as opposed and to then end in that scene where, where he's being picked apart by the birds because he falls down the stairs and then right. all of a sudden later he's just out there. Yeah, so that's a really good point. And I wanted to ask you about that because I agree it would have made more sense and been maybe a little bit more impactful if he had just from there fallen yeah. out of the side. Yeah. Because he ultimately we find him on the rocks. But I think that that imagery of the spiral, like spiraling downwards and like what does that mm-hmm. mean? Like he's he's done like that this is it like he there is no um redemption in this movie like he no. falls down the spiral How i don't is... know That's what i made sense of right yeah but the last shot of this movie is um i don't know there's a lot going on in, in the last couple of minutes of this movie so as soon as you see Robert Pattinson find Robert Pattinson and look up and see naked Willem Dafoe which is now a sexual fantasy of mine it quick cuts to that amazing shot of naked Willem Dafoe and almost like this godlike Michelangelo-esque like just he looks like the statue of fucking David right. looking down with light beaming out of his eyes onto like right. poor Robert Pattinson. What if, if you can just add the blonde guy in then <laughs> well right. my fantasy. <laughs> um throw the mermaid in. <laughs> no, oh it's so great. So did we find what painting that that was a reference to? Um, I have I pulled up something here that says um there's a lot of literary references. There's a an untitled 1888 drawing by a Belgian artist, Jean. That's, that's who it is. I said is Dutch. That what it is? Jean uh, Divel. Di, sure. Di, I'll take it. I don't know how to pronounce that, but I'm just going to mess it up, so I'm not going to try. But it's really great, and it's a person that's like torn apart, and birds are like um, eating that, eating them, and like also what? flying away from them. Yeah, but the way so, they're positioned is very much like in this film. It's the the movie like after um, 
you see that 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 um, shot of Robert Pattinson looking into the lighthouse glass finally and kind of being consumed by it and just all of a sudden falling down the spiral staircase. It quick cuts to it, it like fades to white instead of black, which I love. And then all of a sudden it comes to that beautiful tableau, which is a recreation of that Belgian gentleman's art of Robert Pattinson's beautiful naked body. <laughs> like, but but I say that in all serious though. Serious. Yeah, it though, is like, a beautiful like, shot. Like Willem Dafoe's body in this and Robert Pattinson's bodies in this are the nudity is used so brilliantly. It is. And when you see like Robert Pattinson just on his back, eyes gouged out, his beautiful, beautiful male form, and then just the gulls devouring him, eating his intestines, and all of the seagulls around flocking around. I mean, it's what a beautiful, like what a beautiful way to end that movie. Like right. a, visually, aesthetically, but also like you're just left going like, what the fuck just happened? I love it let's talk about it for the next three years. I, I right. don't know. Uh, what did you think about uh, Cosmopolis that um, Robert Pat Pat Patterson was in? Mm -hmm. um, because I tried watching that and right. I was just like, this isn't working for me. Right, and it, I don't think it, I don't like David Cronenberg's movies per se. I think his movies uh, listed a lot of great performances though like I can't think of the names of the movies now but Vigo, Vigo Mort Mortensen has worked with him twice and oh I love him I love Cronenberg yeah I don't I don't care for his movies but the performances that happen in his movies I love but it and and that's I say I all say that. that for me in Cosmopolis I didn't like that movie it was it was so tedious and like I just right. didn't like it I'm not going to watch anybody in the back of a limo for two and a half hours, okay? But That's but Robert thinking. Pattinson was delivering. And yes. I... Yeah, he has yeah. really stepped up his game as an actor as of late, for sure. Yeah. Um, and I like great, Scanners and Videodrome okay, I'll, a lot. I'll, I'll give you Scanners. I'll give you Scanners. Scanners, Videodrome with, with Debbie Harry talking about... Have you seen Videodrome? No. Okay, you guys I see know, Video I know, Drone. That's one of his seminal ones, I think, for sure. And Naked okay. Lunch. Oh my God, Naked Lunch. I see Naked Lunch. I'll give you Naked Lunch, but like his more recent, like more mainstream things, like the two movies he did with Vigo right. Morris and which are escaping me now, um, and Cosmopolis were like. There's a, I, I there's a not few directors who I really always respected, and then now. They're continuing to do work, and it's like, is this the same person? Right. Yeah. Um, I don't even want to mention them because I have respect for them. But some, you see no, certain directors just, you see certain directors that I'll used to it, really. Right? Tim Burton. Tim Burton. Oh well, what definitely happened? him. But he has Same. the money. But you see, I think some of them, their 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 Hollywood network collapses over time, and they're forced mm -hmm. to do really indie, low budget stuff, which is never gonna realize their vision anyway. Like you've seen, I've seen it with um, John Carpenter, some of his more recent stuff. And I'm like, is this really John Carpenter? Like the guy that did Halloween and stuff right. like, the you thing, know. Yeah. yeah. Well, I but. wanted to, um, one more thing, cause I wanted to get your thoughts on this because you are very much an expert on all movies under the sea and you know from leviathan to proteus which you um sure. introduced me to last year um obviously the abyss is a classic but you have a lot of these more modern day kind of reach and, and more recently underwater with kristen stewart like you have right. all of these these um this constant return to like the the mystery of what's under the water right you know, and of course, this goes back to Moby Dick and, and Greek mythology and back and back and back. 3,000 Leagues Under the Sea. There yeah. you go. I mean, it's, it's man's eternal uh, love affair um, with the sea and what's right. specifically the monsters that live beneath that and what that means psychologically. But in one of the, the um, 
kind of deep dives I did on the lighthouse that David Eggers actually like confirmed that this was something he was teasing out in the lighthouse is these two Greek mythic figures, Prometheus and Proteus, and how they've never, they, they never were in like the same stories. Like they had their own myths and right. their own narrative. And he, yeah. and he combined them in the lighthouse Remix. with Remix, right? And um, <laughs> you have Will so as Proteus, who is just this withholding, all-knowing. Prometheus. No, Proteus is oh. Willem Dafoe, who is okay. this Greek um, right, right. titan, but he's he's all knowing. He's like omniscient, all powerful, um, yes, omnipotent, right. whatever. But he, he's withholding. And then you have Robert Pattinson as Prometheus, who right. ultimately stole fire from the gods to give humans yes. the ability to evolve. And you have these two greek mythic characters playing out on screen would be another way to read the lighthouse and, and we have a have, movie called prometheus and a movie called proteus and they are both excellent and yes. i would argue that proteus is actually better yeah. um how sad is that but yeah i, I mean just available the, on the test at stores everywhere oh, oh my <laughs> Only on the um, yeah. But yeah, I just I liked the idea of rewatching this movie as two gods, like hmm. one right you know, withholding and the other one is like, no, like I'm going to get to the top of Mount Olympus, I'm gonna scale it, I'm gonna find out what the secret is, the grail, yeah. the light house i'm gonna take it from you, and he does, but ultimately it's a sacrifice because he dies. Um, right. So, I mean, how do you read that well, on top of them being? to me, it is <laughs> more like an, an inner monologue film. To me, I do see them as the same person, where it's a battle, it's an internal battle that he yeah. has, like a struggle. But um, clearly, the director has confirmed this and wants to 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 it to also read on that level. So right. you're the expert more so on mythology, but. Um, I and don't so know I much think... about Proteus, but I, you know, Proteus being the name of a science fiction under the sea monster right. movie, you know, I Leviathan, all of I this. Think, I think this director is really skilled at making um, a, a work, a, a piece work on multiple levels. So it's, yes. it's clearly layered and it's clearly working on a bunch of different levels. And I wouldn't be surprised if he had a lot of um, discussions about said levels when he was writing this, like with his brother, because it sounded like an intense writing session where they yeah. wrote it, I think, fairly quickly, but intensely together. And uh, they should be proud of themselves because this is oh, impressive. Yeah. So the, the only other thing I wanted to ask you about is what was your take on the octopus symbolism and like Willem Dafoe kind of being the octopus at the end and also the mermaid, like you, you have this kind of right. quick, quick scene and like the, the third act right after the, Robert Patton. played for shock yeah. value in both cases. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like both cases, they're, they're played for like, they're played confrontationally, shock value, and kind of he's disgusted and um, in a way too. So yeah. I, think it, I think it's symbolic for like confronting something that disturbs you that's that's how i saw it yeah i think there's something really i agree with that 100 percent. and i think there's something really seductive to humans i.e just look at hentai tentacle porn and how popular that shit is like or not i think there's, <laughs> or, yes. not, or not you know, dealer's choice yeah. but um I think there's something no judgment really, <laughs> safe space um there's something really intriguing about like the giant squid as a as a sea creature monster right. as jewel you know twenty thousand leaves as you know just tentacles in general are almost serpentine and their mystery yeah. you know just as much as we are um seduced by and scared of serpents i feel like tentacles have kind of that same thing I where it's like 
allure where it's it's alluring, but it's also deeply terrifying. I was I don't always know. intrigued by like squids and how they have like a beak and how they can like really um they're they're really scary actually. Like in 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 their tentacles there's like a really strong beak. And there's there's giant squids too that are huge in they're the ocean. Cool like the size of a, a giant boat or even bigger. And um, this this is terrifying and scary because that beak would be huge, right? And it's like, it's scary. But um, there's a great TV movie about giant squids um, that's a, a fictional mini, mini series about a giant squid that was actually really well done. I don't have the title of it by memory, but I saw it when I was a kid and it was really influential and I just thought, wow, this is like, it lets your imagination goes wild with what could be yeah. because um, they still say, you still hear from scientists that the sea is one of the, the most unexplored areas on earth. It's, in particular, the deep sea, there are things there, creatures there that we have not discovered yet. There is life there and species there that we have not discovered yet. So what what better to let the imagination go wild than that? Yeah. Right. And That's and crazy. octopuses, octopi, I think there's a little bit of a debate <laughs> linguistically on which one is correct. I grew up with octopi as the plural, but apparently now it's back to octopuses. I like cacti I think octopus, and octopi. Yeah, I think octopuses <laughs> just sounds ridiculous, but it does. I dig octopi and um, squid are highly in, highly intelligent creatures and we're only now just discovering how sentient and how octopi in particular can problem solve at the level of crows, ravens. And they give consent. Um, they all all you find out and you get back to me. Okay. Oh, I'll get right on that. Get on that. Right on top of that rose. Um but you know you, you we're now now that we know that these are also deeply sentient and intelligent and also emotionally intelligent creatures like how much more terrifying that makes them if if they're on a giant scale but right. you know well the, i will leave this um as like my last kind of thing with this um and i want to hear what you want to say about this but you know there's also a lot of um going on here just in terms of like masculinity and what it means to be a man mm -hmm. and what it means to be like like what it, how to unpack that you know this movie really does a lot to get you thinking about like about that and tease that right. out and like how men fetishize and how men um are afraid of their own um homoerotic tendencies like just all of right. this stuff is into this movie without it being yeah. themed and i just think that's fantastic I agree a hundred percent. And I think that there's some men that might watch this movie or people that might watch this movie and not realize that the, the scenes that are sexual are uh, purposeful and they're not um, at all gratuitous. They're there for a reason. And I think when he's watching another man uh, be sexual or when he's about to be kissed by another man, those things are in there for a reason. And so I, I agree a hundred percent that, he's through the whole film i think he's confronting fears and he it's a whole inner monologue about struggle about um failure and and fears and sexuality and what you're attracted to how, what you're willing to be sexual like with you know and so yes so there's a lot and to yourself too like like accepting it Right, and not being afraid of it, or not, and or being willing to accept it, yeah, or coming to terms with it, yeah, right. being confronted by it, all those things. It's it's fascinating film. I, I want to deep dive more thought? into the, the what the director has to say on this film because I've seen some interviews, yeah. but there's a lot more that I still want to watch and read. Yeah, I am very excited for his next project. Um, clearly, he's. Yeah, he set a precedent of what, he's not set a precedent for great filmmaking. He's, he's got a bright he's future. He set a precedent for like, you know, uh, what audiences will right. 
having faith in the audience and 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 not um, talking down to your He's audience. Found an audience, which is great. I think yeah. already in only two films, right? He's found an yeah. audience, and he's young. He's incredibly gifted. He's got a long, bright future ahead of him. So I'm I'm glad we're living in the times we're living in. People bitch so much about everything that's going on because it is so horrible. But um, sometimes you just have to like be grateful. So I'm grateful that we're living in the times of Kate Bush, Madonna, and this man. <laughs> Full circle. Yes. Yes, we are living in the in the times of, Kate of greatness. Bush. A lot of great art that we can appreciate from the past, and a lot of I th hopefully better cultural film and art going forward. Because I think we've been in a slump for a long time. It's been um, a drought, but it feels and like I... we're coming out of it now. It feels like we're starting to see more stuff like this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I agree. With, I think the there's Dune project like that's coming and. Yeah. I mean, the pendulum is starting to swing and, and course correct all of like, so. I love my Marvel. I love all of it, but it's, we need a balance. And I think we're starting to see the, see the pendulum swing in the direction of, of uh, young men and women um, creating art on their own terms and it being backed by studios. And um, this is also, you know, circling back to Chad's very first comment on this film you know it being very claustrophobic it being a container it has a you're in a box the entire time you're watching this movie the movie takes place inside of a four by four square aspect ratio this is a good quarantine movie so um you know this is it's all it, it's it's so interesting that we chose finally to like do this movie now <clears throat> we didn't choose to do it right. during the coronavirus but it's interesting that it took us until now yeah. to do it. And it is I, such a, a quarantine experience when you're watching sure. this movie. Definitely. We've done a couple that have been, and this one certainly follows suit. And I actually think it's not too disturbing for like a broader audience. So I think a, a wider audience could definitely watch this. Um, it's, it's not like, I, what, what do you think is more disturbing, this film or Mother, for maybe the average film goer? Mother would be more disturbing for the average person. I think so. Yeah, I think so. So this is like maybe a good, if you want an artsy film that is going to make you think, but it, no babies isn't like the making of this film. I think there's depths that it could have gone to that it didn't need to, that it didn't. Like it could have got gotten really crazy. Good point. It, you know what I mean? It, yeah, it, it did really good of towing the line and giving you just enough yes. without getting too, like, yeah. um, obvious. It, it's yeah, very... Your imagination yeah. does the rest. Your imagination fills in all the blanks, which is awesome. Yeah, Robert, Robert Eggers slash Eggers, whatever your name is, David Eggers. A new yeah, master. <laughs> A new master. David. <laughs> You are, yeah, we, I, we bow to you and we are so yes, grateful sir. for this. Do you have any final thoughts, anything else you want to touch on that maybe I steamrolled you on or like we didn't get to? No, I want to make sure. You not at all. No, um, I just think he's great. And I, I even love him in interviews. Like he's so well-spoken. So I think he's going to be a great person to watch. So maybe yes. we'll, we'll do more of his films when they come out, maybe. Amen. Well, with that, we thank you guys, as always, for watching. Um, please always feel free to comment down below what your thoughts are on the movie. Um, if you know what the terminology is for having sex with a mythological creature, please comment down below, because we don't. Um, and uh, stay tuned Hurry. for more movie hours. Subscribe, notification bell, like, all the rest of it. And um, cheers. We will see you on the other side. Cheers.